Thank you, Marina. Mm, good morning, everyone. Uh, not my favorite time of day as well, <laughs> but uh, I, I guess we'll all manage. And uh, Dan Miken is my name. I do come from uh, Brand Manual, as, uh, as introduced, and uh, I am a designer. So this is how the Creative Mornings will be uh, kicked off by, by the design subject. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So serendipity, it feels as, yeah, just good luck that comes down on you and uh, good stuff happens to you. Um, I truly believe that uh, good stuff happens to people who are well prepared. And uh, uh, I will go into a little bit of detail on that. Uh, there are many definitions uh, of design. Uh, what, what is design? Uh, again, this is, this is my point of view, but for me this is a very practical discipline. So a designer solves issues, solves problems, or sol solves uh, challenges, but it's, it's always for a purpose. Uh, I love working for someone else. Not just ex expressing myself. Yeah, creativity is a great tool. And being talented and know how to draw or uh, program or whatever. But, uh, but this is not a means of self-expression. Self it's, it's a mean of tackling somebody else's problem. And in order to do that, uh, designers are very lucky to have clients and these clients have their clients and what designers do is bring these two viewpoints together so uh, one of the main um, um, uh, main skills or main talents that a good designer should have is uh, is compassion and uh, ability to see the world through somebody else's eyes. That, that's where we come, uh, come in useful. So let's start from the very, very beginning. Uh, imagine that uh, uh, you're giving birth. Uh, for me, yeah, it, it may be a bit hard, but uh, I've been practicing. Uh, and I've been, been practicing being as close to it as possible, so about three times. And, uh, and the first time it, ha it happened, it was yeah, a happy experience, but also quite frustrating because you, you have a lot of pain. You don't know if it's, if it's a good pain or a bad pain, and what, what should you do, and where, where should you go. And when you go there, there are no people like... Uh, receiving you with, with flowers and shouts, and they just shuffle you onto some bed, and then they leave, and uh, you don't know what, what's going on. And uh, there's a lot of um, uncertainty, and uh, this is a novel experience for you. It's not just for, for the baby. Uh, for, for you, a lot of stuff happens for the first time, and you have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, on the second run, it was, it was way easier because we had already practiced a little bit. And on the third time, we were like, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> uh, but also what happened in the course of these 10 years uh, was uh, that the service provider, in that case, the maternity ward, uh, the hospital, it had it had changed. It, it uh, had done a lot of design in the meantime. They really had looked at it through the user's eyes. This young couple who comes in and has no clue what's, what's going to happen next. So uh, on the third run, yeah, we were welcomed without the flowers, but they said, what's going to happen in the course of the next few hours? We shouldn't worry. Now it's okay. We, will, we are leaving now because 
nothing will happen in the next 15 minutes. And we'll be back and we'll check on you. And um, through all the process, we were kind of guided. Regardless of the fact for that for the people receiving us, uh, yeah, maybe it was the 31st baby that day. And all 5,000th uh, baby in the course of their career. For them, it was all obvious. And for us, it was a little bit less obvious. And then for first-time parents, it was not obvious at all. But they realized that they have to walk us through this. So that was a, a good case of, uh, of design uh, here in Estonia. Uh, maybe this is a little bit easier to imagine. Yeah, you, you end up in, a, in an ER room. I, I guess most of you have, have been there. And maybe you have also noticed that things are going slightly better, that they, they also understand that there are people who uh, may, are maybe not in the clearest state of mind, and they just need help, and you can't deliver help right, right now to them. So you have to keep them calm and tell them uh, how they will be treated, when they will be treated, and what happens in the meantime. So my suggestion to you is basically break a leg, <laughs> literally, and uh, see things from, from that perspective, from the perspective of a person who has a lot of stuff on their mind, not, not I'm now going to enjoy the service or the product, because that's what uh, product owners quite often think, that people just come in, breathe out, and start using their, their product or service. This is not what happens usually. People have a broken leg on their mind. Uh, you don't have to do that literally. Sometimes, yeah, just tying up your leg or, or pretending you have a leg or uh, binding your eyes and go and walk through the city as a blind person. And that will open your eyes to, to many, many things that you could make work better as a designer. <coughs> There's a great story. Uh, I don't know what um, company it was, but it was producing adult diapers. And there are several companies out there doing the same thing, and they were not doing particularly well. So uh, people were not buying the product of people we're thinking that some other adult diapers are better than theirs. And this is a product for people who really need this stuff. They don't have much options. They have a problem, there is a product that solves it. And uh, there was this board of managers and directors who was trying to figure out what's, what's wrong, why our product is, is not that good. And then the CEO came in and she said that, yeah, well, today, we'll have a little workshop. Actually, you can work on whatever you like. There, are, there is a case of beer so that you will feel very ha really happy doing this work in the course of this day. There are just, there are just two rules. You are not going to leave this room and there is no toilet. And here is a stack of adult diapers. And all these guys in ties had to manage. And, and they did. And by the end of that day, they had lived through what their clients are living on a, very, on a daily basis. And, but they created much better designs after that. So what I'm also trying to to tell you that whatever you are designing, you don't have to like it. Uh, it's, it's super cool to do something that I really enjoy and, and um, use on a daily basis. And I'm a, I'm a big fan, I don't know, of bicycles. And, and I'm a bicycle designer. And I'm living my dream and so on. But uh, it's just a little fraction of your life. And uh, a much bigger challenge is to 
design something for people who have completely different preferences or completely different lifestyles. This is where things get interesting. Uh, yeah, there's uh, little baby octopuses. Uh, some love them. I do. I'm, I mean, like, cons consuming them. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and some people hate them. And uh, in, in, case, uh, in case you hate them, I, I can do whatever. I'm trying to sell this idea to you and, and you will not eat them at all. But there are people who, who like them. And if you yeah, put yourself into these people's shoes, then you will also figure out why one baby octopus is better than the other ones. Or what you should do, should you do with, with yours so that they will find more fans. And in case of baby octopuses, yeah, serendipity. I happen to like them. So it's, it's way easier for me to, uh, to imagine other people liking them. But I have no emotional connections to these guys. But try to imagine that there is a huge community who uh, just adores them. And then they know all the little nuances and they know all the categories and they know all the families and, and poses and I don't know what, whatever makes them kick. And try to design that. So, as I said, you don't have to be the person in this world, but you have to imagine or get into that world one way or the other. One way to do that is um, just taking a step back and observe. Um, I guess in most of the cities you have seen these cut corners. So there is this new development or old development, everything is perfectly laid out, nice and, and geometrical. And then you see how people walk their own way. Mm. And it used to be considered a problem. So why don't people use the stuff the way we designed it for them? So there is a smarter way to solve that. And what a lot of developers do, do these days is, yeah, of course, they try to anticipate stuff. So they create their design, they build a building, they uh, lay out the general layout of the surroundings, but they, they don't finish it. And they uh, let people use it for a while. And after like one summer, they have a pretty idea where to lay the path. So uh, let, let the people do the design for you. About the role of a designer. So I was talking about uh, being lucky to have, to have clients. So um, <laughs> when I was young, we were just talking with Katri about uh, uh, leaving high school and what am I going to do next? And there was this idea of oh, maybe you will become an artist. And that was this very predicament that, you know, what, what I would be painting about. Yeah, my own sufferings? Or what? <laughs> Does it mean that I need to suffer now? <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was really lucky to stumble upon the discipline of design, that there is a business case that you pick up and you make it work better. So on one, one end, there's a business owner. It's either product producer or uh, a service provider. And uh, on, she has this product or service that she knows everything about, and she has created it. On the other end is the user. And designer, the, in a classical rule, has this position in between them. So a designer takes a product or a service and interprets it uh, for the user. Sounds kind of familiar. 
Um, so what I, what I would like you to do is to turn these things around. So why don't we look at stuff with the user's eyes, walk the path in their shoes, uh, break a leg, um, and taking that knowledge, go to the business owner and together with her having that knowledge, design a better product. And believe me, this product will sell itself later on without much outside help because it's meant for people, not for concepts. Yeah. Another game of imagination. Imagine you are flying somewhere and this is a huge airport that um, you have never been to before. Kind of, again, familiar concept. And I had uh, um, well, I, I still have my mother-in-law, uh, but a couple of years ago there was an occasion when she um, traveled to, to Japan and she had lost her husband uh, a little time before that and I was a kind of worried. I, I love my mother-in-law. She's a very nice person and uh, she had never traveled alone before. So I was, I was worried that yeah, she took on this crazy idea of traveling to Japan. This, uh, totally different culture. They are not even using the same letters as we are. So how would she manage? And then she came back and I said, yeah, oh, I'm happy to see you alive. <laughs> how, how was it? And she said, yeah, no worries. In Japan, everything is crystal clear. And the moment you start to, yeah, most things are translated into English and her English is not even that good, but still she, she managed. And the moment you looked a little bit lost, Somebody came to you and, and guided you in the direction you, you needed to. Where she got lost was uh, Helsinki Airport. <laughs> <laughs> so something must have been wrong there. Uh, so again, how do you make people use stuff, in this case an airport, so that they will just find their way? This is a very great challenge. And uh, in case of an airport, people don't register the design at all. They don't look, oh, how, how nice guiding signs. I just love the navigation here. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's a cool stuff to, to show your colleagues. This is not our work, but this is yeah, some, some of the work that we, we have been searching for when working on our projects. And uh, airport is the ultimate challenge in, uh, in a navigation project. So, but good navigation is, is completely invisible. So you find the sign at the moment when you need it and then you forget about it because you're, now you know where, where you're going. Um, especially if you're from other culture. Uh, but it's not just about signage. Think even deeply about airports. Go into the user's, uh, user's eyes and, and, uh, and her shoes. Um, one, one thing is, yeah, it's, it's a transport hub. You just want to get from one airplane to the other. But um, is it always the case um, that you just need to get from one plane to another. Sometimes you need to spend like five hours there. And this is why people hate airports, because they, this well-designed big space actually can get pretty annoying at some point. So there is this nice little airport in Tallinn, which people actually, I've heard, quite enjoy. So this is a compliment to the designers of Tallinn Airport that they really tried to make it uh, a non-airport. So for Estonians, you feel already that you have a right home. And if you're a transit per 
passenger or you're flying out, then you just feel comfortable. There's a little library, there are cafes, there are playgrounds, and they all are not designed for the masses. They are designed for, for people who actually may enjoy using them. So little stuff. Another story, a designer story, uh, concerns a power drill. I've told this story many times, um, and it always ends in the same place, that, um, again, imagine that you are selling power tools. You have a hardware store, and there is a lot of equipment, and a guy comes in and says that, yeah, I need a power drill. And if you do your job very well, then you will sell him yeah, the best tool you have with like three batteries and, and a lifetime warranty and uh, 55 different appliances that can attach to it. Uh, is this what he came for, is the question. If you would be a, a good designer, you would ask him in the first place that, what do you need it for? And maybe the answer is, I need to hang a picture on the wall. The guy who came in, he does not need a power drill. He needs a problem to be solved, and that problem is a picture, wall, and how do I put these two together? And if these walls are gypsum, then all he needs is a screw and a screwdriver. Yep, you will not make a couple of hundred of euros on this particular deal, but you will have a lifetime warranty of, of a lifetime warranty of his loyalty, because he will know that when he comes to you, you will solve his problem, not take away a couple of hundred euros from him. So this is uh, a story from. Um, from my own experience, from my own portfolio, we were working on uh, a small marina. Mm. It looks pretty grungy, but it's also what makes it cool, because it's set in, uh, in an old submarine factory here in Tallinn. So this old industrial nightmare has been converted into a modern recreational space. And, uh, we went there and looked at it from the port captain's point of view. So um, it looks nice, yep. There is a slipway on the left. Uh, there is enough space for big and small yachts in the middle. There is a really good restaurant on the right. And there is even uh, a concert hall where they play Arvo Parte every now and then. And it's all well nicely laid out. You can see where you should go. Uh, it's all in, uh, on the palm of your hand. But our task was to make it a better service for people who come in from, let's say, Germany or Sweden on the yacht. So this is their customer, their user. And, uh, how does the customer look at a marina for the first time? So what we did was we took a boat and went to the Tallinn Harbor. And this is what the customer sees. What, whatever nice restaurants you have, it doesn't matter at this point. I, I can't find the place. And this is not the wool of Tallinn's seacoast. It's just a small section. There are more ports to the left and there are more ports to the right. And you are somewhere here. So how do you make yourself findable in the first place? There are a lot of sailors who don't really know how to navigate. So just giving them coordinates may help and it may not. Maybe they don't know how to read a map. So just asking these questions actually makes you, makes you think that maybe the thing that you have designed doesn't work all the way. 
So in this case, it was pretty obvious that we have to, yes, we have to mark the entrance pretty clearly, both, uh, both the coordinates, uh, but also visually. There was no sign. You had no idea that this green boy was directing you to the, to the port. Uh, once you were in the marina, it didn't look much better. You didn't even know that you are in the right place. Yeah, the sail invest on the big uh, blue box there doesn't tell you anything. You're looking for a no nobles port noblesna, and it doesn't say that. So already these little things. Uh, okay, let's imagine that you took all your courage, you tied your boat to the pier and decided that I guess this is the right place. This is where you need to check in. Again, it doesn't say that. You just have to imagine. This is where we took the first photo from, where everything was clear, everything was logical. If you look from down there, the picture is quite different. Even if you take up to the ground, yeah, that's where you should go, the, behind these cars. And then there is this fence. <laughs> so this, uh, this office sign is already added there by us because it wasn't there. It was just a metal fence with, uh, with a price list. So th this is just a little exercise. This is just guiding people to the office because that's the first thing they need to do was quite, quite obvious, which is even more obvious is office is not the first place they are going to go because they have been at sea for the past 20 hours. So imagine what's the first place they are going. Toilet. Exactly. <laughs> so make the toilet findable first and then think about the other stuff. And whatever nice marina you're building, you have to always to keep in mind that people don't come to the marina. Yeah, it has to fulfill, it's like an airport. It has to be nice, it has to guide you through and, and so on. But people never go to airports. And the same thing goes for, for marinas. They came here because they heard somewhere that Tallinn is a nice place. So guide them there, say that it's a 20 minutes walk, which is quite okay. And there are buses and, and there are also grocery stores, so where you can get your supplies. And there are some nightclubs if you're interested in that. So, this is what people came for, not to check out your gorgeous submarine base. Into more tangible stuff. So um, there are a lot of people who say that, yeah, you have to have a good product. And that's what I've been telling you all the time. The product is, uh, a good product is paramount. But packaging it right is, uh, is important as well. And it's not just a little added value. Good packaging will make the product better for the user. And bad packaging, if they can find your product at all, but it can also ruin it, even if it's great inside. Um, there's a story about, uh, what's my time? And there's a story about uh, uh, Tallinn, post-war Tallinn, 1940s, uh, when there was not too much food in the, in the shops, but there were farmers who came in every morning and were selling milk uh, to local folks. And people lined up, they knew that this particular farmer, the Apshi, has very good quality milk. And then some, there were some people who saw that lady for the first time. And when they approached, they, uh, they registered that she's pouring this milk out with this toilet part. People who have been using, uh, or who have been buying from her for many, many days or many, uh, many weeks already knew that, yeah, it's not taken from under a bed. But it, she just bought it as a new, because it's a convenient tool for her. But for people who didn't 
know that story, they, uh, they couldn't get the picture out of their heads. The milk was ruined for them because the package was wrong. Yeah, we can have a lot of these comparisons. They're both good products, I guess. Uh, they cost more or less the same amount of money to produce. Well, maybe the, the drink on the right is two times more expensive. But the cost on the shelf, yeah, the thing on the, on the right is, is 100 plus euros. And most of it is due to the packaging. And we can't say that uh, people are fools buying just a packaged, uh, packaged booze uh, for 100 euros. They're buying an experience. Maybe it's a gift. Maybe they want to present it to someone. How it looks, how you open it, how you put it on a shelf or a table, it all matters. It's all part of how the product lives. So that means that package is, uh, is more than just a shell. From our own experience, uh, there's a beer which is made in Estonia, but which sells uh, in London's five-star hotels for like six or seven quid a bottle. And this is not, uh, not a craft beer, and not, nothing very special about the stuff in the bottle. It's, it's just a lager, but it looks nice. I'm not saying that craft beers are inferior. No, craft beers are very cool stuff, and we have been working with them too. But in this very particular case, we had to understand who are the guys who are buying it. They are customers at the five-star hotel. There's only one beer among all the champagnes and cognacs they have there. And it has to look nice, because if I buy it, I, it has to glitter in my hand. So basically, this is what, what we did. And then we added a little bit of obscurity to it, that it comes from a country that you have never heard about. In, in, in case of a beer, it works. <laughs> uh, so go traveling. Go to, I don't know, Istanbul. And, and look at how stuff is packaged or how is it served to you. Because you have to make very quick decisions in, uh, in a foreign environment. Yeah. And these places both tell you something. One promises your a quick local bite, and the other thing uh, promises you like three hours of really upscale experience. Again, they may be both great products or they may be really bad products. We don't know yet, but how it's packaged already gives us some kind of a promise. So how, how do you get there? How do you get that customer point of view? How do you look at stuff through, through the eyes? Is, yeah, it's really methodical. We uh, are using a system designed by the British Design Council, which is called the Double Diamond. And it all starts with discovery. Like in the Ports case, we go out there and see how the stuff works or how it doesn't work. And uh, once we have done the discovery part, we pile up a lot of information. That's where the funnel goes really, really wide. And it can get pretty frustrating. So that's why we defined what is important about this particular service. So there is always one thing that stands out. So we have to find, find it. And once we have found it, then developing it is easy peasy. But you don't do it only once. So if you have a, a stuff that is supposed to work not just one, for one season, but for years or decades, then you are in a constant loop of, of learning. There is this word, Ouroboros, which means a snake that eats its own tail. So design process is like that a little bit. So you do stuff, you get to the end, and then you start all over again. Because in the process of doing the, the service, you have learned so much 
about how it works, how it doesn't work. You are again observe, fix your mistakes, do it all over again. In the course of the next iteration, the world has changed. So we have to redo it all, all over again. And that's okay. So the double diamond is not a do just a double diamond, that's a chain of diamonds. And uh, as I said, always start with a discovery. Look at your product, look at your customers, look at the competition, and uh, go shopping. And it sounds f fabulous, but actually, <laughs> not, not every time. But going really out there and, and see what they do, what they consume, how many seconds they spend on making decisions at one shelf or the other. Actually, it gives you quite an insight. Uh, this is a tool that we use in our discovery process. That, yeah, all these nice sharp pictures about the products are nice on, nice on paper on our, or on a presentation. But when people go to approach a shelf, this is more or less what they see. A blurred view of, um, of a subject. And you have to figure out what are these focus points where people will, what they will pick up. And based on these focus points, they will make very, very quick decisions. A couple of seconds maybe, maybe half a minute, but that, that's it. So when a client has built a product or a portfolio, it usually look, looks like this. It's all, it's all very nice. It's, it uses good photography, yeah, some added red tomatoes and stuff like that. So it's really good quality photo. I, know, I have no doubt about it. So how the consumer sees it. Th this is the same product on a shelf here. And this is the reality that you have to work with. You have to see what goes on out there, not in a studio. So yes, we designed the product, we photographed it nicely, but we also did a lot of these uh, shop, shop mock-ups and we are monitoring how it now performs on real live shop shelves and it's way not ready yet but we have given it a good start and now we are doing iterations and figuring out how how to make it even work even better because this is what consumer sees in the, in the big scale of things this is uh, a project by Andreas Gursky yeah, that's an artist who yeah, kind of illustrates the reality of our lives by this photograph. 60,000 products are sold in Prisma, different items. And you just spend an hour there and you want to buy the stuff that you need. So how do you make your decisions as a consumer? It goes to, for digital products as well. So when working out identities, for example, for our customers, again, we don't present them on a big screen as, yeah, this is your new logo or new, uh, new tag. This is where it will fight, where will it uh, uh, work for its survival. Mm -hmm. So, go shop. Th this is your humble servant not just shopping, but also working in a shop to get even a better view, talking to customers, but also trying to understand how, how the people on the ground are feeling and why they are so grudgy. There are a lot of reasons for that. So go out there. So if you are looking for, for answers to your questions, then you will get answers that you're looking for. But if you just go out there, open your eyes and your ears, then you will find the unexpected. Then you will find something to work on. And this is what Serendipity is. Thank you. <laughs>